glad you introduced the political dimension to the conversation right now. Before I deal with that, though, um, I think what the reason I wanted to be here, and I want to thank Brendan for uh, twisting my arm and inviting me, and I'm glad I'm here, <laughs> is that it's very helpful for me to know that on the ground in member states that we have networks like you. It makes it more real, so when I'm talking at the committee, I can actually reflect stuff so that's happened here in the borough. Um, and I think it's also respectful of your presence here that I would come and listen to you and then in turn give you some pointers around some of the difficult issues we face in relation to capital form. I think there is um, a struggle at the moment uh, within farming, a struggle between farmers, a desire that we reach these sustainable development goals, to have a sustainable communities, um, to keep family farming alive. There's a whole range of objectives which are dear to our hearts, but they're difficult to actually implement. The burren is unique. I mean, I think that's absolutely clear. It is unique. Yeah. Brendan is very unique. <laughs> and we wanted to clone him, but we banned us in Europe. So we cannot clone him and his team. But what it shows you is that if there is a driver of this type of project, with an absolute conviction about the project, then anything is possible. So the human factor is crucial in all of these things. Any projects on the leader that I've been involved in or visited, I mean, the name of the project and the product was important, but actually for the individuals driving them that made them a success or a change. So thank you, Brendan, for your commitment through the years and to have uh, this group here now trying to learn from each other of what works and what doesn't. In relation to CAP reform, we had a discussion on the PPP group, but all groups are having these conversations about the direction of CAP reform on subsidiarity, which is what has been, I suppose, proposed, that member states will have more control over how the policy is implemented within each member state. There are two levels of thought on it. First of all, when I asked a group of Irish farmers when the proposal first came out, I had a big delegation of my constituents, I said, hand up those who would like to see uh, the department in Dublin have more control over the specifics of policy. Very few hands went up. When I said, so you prefer Brussels, they said, yes. And yet in truth, when uh, we talk about uh, rules today, people give out about Brussels as being too interfering. So, I think we need to settle this conversation by, by being more honest about what exactly we want here. The idea for me of member states having more detailed control in their member state makes sense. But then you do have to ask the question, will there be different emphasis within the member states about my nature of having fun? Maybe we need in the policy framework that emerges out of our committee and out of plenary and out of negotiations with council to stitch in some of those strategic issues so that member states cannot pick and choose to the detriment of the specific sectors that you are interested in. Really, this is going to be a very difficult process because within groups and between groups of the European Parliament, there are huge differences about what Commissioner Holder has proposed. There is not even an agreement as to whether we will get it over the line um, by the European elections of May next year. The anticipation is it will be difficult to deliver before the elections, even though we're working towards it. We should get it through committee, which means we are drafting amendments now on all of these policy areas. And I would ask those of you who have specific issues for your own MEPs to get them to it, because we've had a great conversation on our table here, and I'm hoping to draw on some of that in terms of putting amendments in place which help us uh, in fact reform. Some of the issues that I struggle with are the definition of a genuine farmer. I mean, if you ask a room of farmers, I wonder, are, who's not genuine in the room? I mean, who's going to say, I'm not a genuine farmer? But how do you define it? So these are difficult issues that need to be defined. And then there is the overall budget part, which will shrink. As we know, the proposal is that less money will be available, and yet we want to do more with uh, the, the funding that is there. Um, we've had a big debate in Ireland around convergence of payments. It has to happen. The question is, how long will it take? Um, and then we have also a desire to keep rural areas vibrant. And the areas that you speak of seem to me to be those areas most vulnerable in terms of uh, whether we have sustainable communities. My biggest worry is that in Ireland uh, and elsewhere across Europe, while we want generational renewal, 
It's very difficult to persuade any of my four children that it's a good idea to farm if their entire income comes from the single farm hen. If they're not feeling that their products or their whatever they produce has a market value that rewards them with income. We're not going to solve that tonight, but I think we have to have the conversation. And one of the areas I've led in in the Parliament is around uh, unfair trading practices in the food supply chain. So I think we need to watch the between producer and consumer, what's happening there. Because again, under um, sustainable development goals, we have to look at how we're producing, where we're producing, um, food waste, the packaging, all of these things that have to be taken into account. Not all of them can be dealt with in that reform, but some of them can be. It's a complicated policy. We had such a good conversation here that we didn't agree on anything because it's so complicated. But I think the, the, the overall theme of what we were talking about was to try and make the cap fairer, which is you know really important to us, to make sure that those who are delivering both uh, public um, goods and food are rewarded. And you know, I've come, I hope you're not going to be around later because you're going to hear a lot of this again, but bear with me. I used to work on a program in the 1980s on public service broadcasting here called Landmark. And when I was a very young journalist, we were teaching farmers how to rip out hedgerows, drain the land, lash on the fertilizer, and increase your yields. It was a one directional development in the early 80s. And that was policy at the time. It was driven by uh, policy makers. We then understood over time that that had consequences which we didn't anticipate. And now we're teaching, I worked on a program up until I got elected, which taught farmers how to plant hedgerows, how to leave land if it was flooded, and how nature needed to have a space in our farmlands. So in a way, um, the policy of the past has given us the policy of today, and we're struggling to make sure that it, it meets with our commitments for the future. This area is a huge tourist area, as well as being a sustainable community. I like what you said about the learnings of how we can engage in people in this project. And um, also, you know, the farmers didn't come to the world, the bits came together, but there was a delivery for that. I think farmers are under awful pressure. I think there's a sense of the local farmers that I work with, and I'm, I'm an agricultural background, I live on a farm, is that some of them feel their, their worth, their value in society has lowered. Um, and I think that that's something that's unhelpful. We need boots on the ground to manage our landscape and to look out for all of these public goods and environmental services that are there. And some of the complex language around all of that I don't think helps us. So I think we need a better way to communicate what exactly we're trying to do. Because land is a private asset, but there's a huge public, public good dimension to it. So what I really want to say is, I have not because there are many complex questions, but I'm certainly open to listening to the proposals. I have to say that in Ireland, the divisions within our farming sectors are quite deep. Some have a view about the future that doesn't match others. Um, but we're very concerned to make sure that our landscape in Ireland, which is varied, but it's managed by family farms and that continues into the future, which is why the projects you're involved in are important. And sometimes I think in the public debate, we don't appreciate the amount of work that individual farmers and collective farmers are doing for the environment. Because you only hear about the bad stuff. We only hear when water is polluted or when there are problems, and we don't hear about the actual positive developments that are happening at our level. So maybe we need more of this type of engagement with policymakers. You have members of the European Parliament, all of you must know them, I hope, do you? Help of those who know the members elected to the European Parliament. Really that is shocking. <laughs> <laughs> I have the Irish, you know, they're married. They're running to the house. <laughs> <laughs> and I think one of the first reasons is that, thank you. And one of the reasons, okay, you don't have to name One of the reasons we know them in Ireland is because we're directly elected. So no matter how big my constituency is, I have to go out at election time and talk to people and do it all the time. I think if you're on a list system for elections, you're not quite under that pressure. I'd also hope that maybe Brexit and the talk is a lesson. Um, it's a very difficult process for Europe and the United Kingdom and particularly for Ireland. And maybe we weren't wise in listening to what was going on in the United Kingdom around that discontent. 
Uh, and I think those of us who value yeah. collaboration between yeah. countries, which is what you're doing, yeah. because ultimately, yeah. my way to meet the core interests of all our yeah. people yeah. are the same. Yeah. Um, and I think we should work hard to try and break down those barriers uh, that might exist between you and your members of the European Parliament. I hope that in my work in the Parliament and my work in my constituency, I have been connected. Um, and I'm very honest to say that I know all of the problems. I could write a book about them. But I don't have all of the solutions. And the solutions will have to come yeah. from projects, projects like yours and be delivered by people like you, and that we as policymakers need to be open. So I would say, just in my parting remark, is if there's a way that you can deliver your message to the European Parliament, <coughs> let's find out. Um, rather than ask to the events if nobody listens, I mean, find a way to get it into us. Because a lot of members of Parliament are struggling to do the right thing, but are constrained by. Um, political issues, and this is a political policy. Um, it's a really political policy, which is why you asked a very political question. And I think the answer to your question is that, you know, people give out about Brussels until somebody else is taken over control, and then maybe Brussels wasn't so bad. Um, so I don't know how this debate really actually ends, but I know that in France and in other member states there's a real concern about breaking up a, a policy that is common by this new delivery model. So I think we are conscious about that. Um, but we agreed on this table, um, because I've experienced the New Zealand model and the total Illinois of subsidies. And in Europe, because of the objectives we set um, in terms of territorial balance, um, and also the needs of human beings uh, and communities, we want to have a policy that supports all of those good things. If we were designing it from scratch, we wouldn't start here. We're trying, as I said earlier, to move the Titanic almost while it's still afloat and put it in a direction where it will be safe. Um, and we need your help to do that. Um, and I would urge you to communicate with your own representative here. That is our job to listen. But, but remember that point that I made. I sent it to the vulnerability of my friends' families. Many of them don't feel that they have a success. Anyone interested can take it over. Um, they know that they've been asked to do more in college or more in biodiversity. Um, and they need help to do that, including good advisory systems. I mean, the day I'm saying we need to maximize production from a cow without explaining the in terms of welfare, reward, and care, and time, and people are over. We have a reasonable system now in terms of advisory systems compared to the rest of Europe. I think there's a big pulling away of public money for public research. And I think that's something that absolutely has to be addressed. Sorry that I've run me all of this. It's a huge honor to have listened to you uh, and to hear your perspectives. It looks like you're all getting on very well. So you're having too good a time. Uh, but that's the nature of the borough. And I hope it's the nature of Ireland as well. I think we have a small member state capacity to get on with it. Because if we didn't, we'd be crushed completely. So it's all about the rest of the You know, uh, there are not many of us who will be trying to get us a bank in place. Um, and I hope you'll also remember the whole point of European, because I'm going to tell you something part of it. And you know, we're at a difficult place that's what's happening across the member states. So we need people who are driven by a higher idea to actually talk up the positives that Europe brings. Let's fix the things it's doing badly, but it's doing a hell of a lot that's good, and let's value that. Thank you all very much.